My name is Craig, and this is a talk about world building. This builds on some blog posts I've made, so if you haven't read those, this isn't going to make very much sense. If you are interested, the links should be in the sidebar. Anyway, this whole thing started about a year and a half ago when I built this program called China Sim, and the idea here was to have a program which would export a world which would be suitable for use in a Legend of Three Kingdoms scenario or similar. The um, the driving principle was that every one of these little fragmented states, little provinces, needed to have its own unique culture, heroes, soldiers, uh, tactical challenges, instead of being such a basic um, setup that you get when you normally do random stuff where it's just, this guy, this guy has iron, this guy has metal. So, when it started with a simple world-building algorithm, which builds up a blob of land, and uh, weathers it and puts down some resources. Now this has been through a lot of iterations so it's pretty kludgy at this point but I've actually taken almost all of the resources out. It turns out that you just don't need them and I'll talk more about that in just a second. Anyhow, uh, it's creating a land um, out of a simulation, out of an algorithm is not a straightforward process but this particular um, simulation isn't worth talking about. It's very primitive. Uh, so it's all programmed in C-sharp, by the way, XNA, so it can be ported to the Xbox 360 if necessary. Anyhow, what it's doing now is it's populating that land you just saw with uh, starter, fa starter factions. I've disabled city building because otherwise you won't be able to see anything, but that means that I also had to disable the war because we'd run out of cities. Um, because this is a very, very high definition thing, you probably can't see it in a YouTube video, these white blotches that are spreading in the middle of some of these jungles, those are not cities, those are clearings around cities, um, which are cut down forests in order to serve as gathering wood. The actual land owned by the cities and farmed by the cities is so small that you can't see it. The dot that represents the city is too large. So this world map is very large. It's much larger than any other world map you've probably seen before. Um, it's at least ten times larger than the largest civilization world map, which is why it would be so hard to see what was going on if city building was still turned on. What you might not be able to see very well, and this is why I actually built a different program, which I'll be showing you in a moment, is that these cities all have trade routes to each other. And what I found is as soon as I put the trade routes in, what resources people were gathering was almost unimportant. Uh, as long as a city had resources, that was all that mattered. It didn't matter whether those resources were food or gold or horses or whatever they were. Instead, what mattered was who was in position to receive which transports, who had the best roads, who had the longest trans transport routes, who had the safest transport routes. I tried a bunch of different ways of simulating that, but in the end, it turned out that whatever way you use to simulate it, unless you downplay it ridiculously, you end up with a world where trade is what matters and individual cities that gather resources aren't very important. Um, it also comes with a basic name and culture generator, but none of that's important either, at least not in this topic. So let me show you the new version, which is here. This version is primarily better because it allows me to scale the world to any size I want. I've chosen the smallest sizing because of frame rate concerns. I'm recording after all. Um, it lets me put down land and then simulate that land changing over time. The river simulation is a lot rougher in this one rather than the actually rather detailed simulation I had running for the previous version. Um, and that's just because I didn't really spend very much time on it. The world generation is very secondary. So let's take a look at this island, which is the only island on the map, and we got some spawns. Um, these were the initial human tribe spawns. There are some travelers here. And they just settled into two new nations. This blotchy pattern is people claiming land. There is a better way to do it, but I haven't finished implementing it yet. Um, there are actually lots of ways to do it, and my primary concern is to keep it simple enough that it can be simulated in real time. And you'll see why that's difficult as I run this simulation forward just a couple of years. Uh, let me actually move this so you can see the year counter. That's the year in the upper uh, upper right there. Every single name you're seeing is a city. So if I zoom in here, 
you can see that not only are there cities, there are actually ruins, um, which we'll not bother talking about, but all of these cities belong to Igani. Again, there's another random name generator, but um, it's not the purpose of this particular talk, so we'll ignore it. And Igani's color is this kind of greenish color, greenish blue. These red guys over here, or orange guys, don't appear to exist anymore. It looks like they got conquered while I wasn't looking. Um, then there's these pale guys who haven't been doing anything. But you'll notice that the pale guy is Jurina uh, from Joe Crossing. <laughs> he has a travel, he has a uh, road running up to Igani's Denfield. And of course, Igani has whole bunches of roads connecting their internal stuff. Um, or not very many, actually, because we're not very far into the sim. But basically, Igani might not want to cross Joe Crossing. They might not want to conquer them. They might not want to be mean to them. Because this transit line counts in their favor, regardless of who controls it. Because transport is the only thing that matters, the idea that where your boundaries are is the most critical point, it, it's not the most critical point. Um, what roads connect you to where is the most critical point, and if those connections happen to be to another city that's owned by some alien, that, you know, some other nation, so long as you don't have like a non-trade agreement or something else similar, you'll still be receiving plenty of funds from that kind of trading. And as you can see, vastly superior Igani is not impinging, is not encroaching on, uh, on Joe Crossing. They're leaving it alone. Now, at some point, they'll buy Joe Crossing. Uh, they'll just get so incredibly strong that that their culture will just overwhelm the Junar and a uh, built-in culture, and, and they'll just claim the city. Um, and they're also spreading over here, so they don't have to. They don't have to just spread by buying. They can spread by actually walking around. Um, and as you can see, these guys down here, um, head, they've got a bunch of cities just randomly scattered around the map. There are a bunch of different approaches they can take. Um, fundamentally, the thing that I find when I build something like this is that cities um, are mostly about being either supply points or a hub for trade. Um, and in this case, this red background that they're on is uh, something similar to an oil field. It's just a, a big generic resource, which means that all of these cities are sitting on untold riches, which is why they're doing so well, even though they're not on an ocean or a river. Um, normally you get cities like this which are on an ocean and a river and they do well. The blue ones are doing better than the green ones in terms of size. Um, I just wanted to share this. Basically it means that regardless of what exact simulation you use, trade routes end up being more important than resources and they also mean that you do not have to have a game where the only purpose is to destroy the other guy's nation. Um, too many games, including something like Civilization, uh, the border is, is a barrier, and the problem is that you always have to think about things in terms of conquering the other person, and in terms of limiting them and destroying them. That's, uh, I guess that's fine, but I'd like to have some games where the idea is a little bit more delicate, a little more complicated, and in this case, even though, Jun, Jun, uh, even though Joe's crossing border actually spreads into what is unequivocally Igani's space, including, including crossing over their cities at times, Igani doesn't bother to quell, twibble about it. They didn't even claim the land when they plunked the city down, just because they benefit so much from Joe crossing and the road that connects them to Denfield. Uh, of course, bad AI, or good AI, makes all the difference. And in this case, the AI is actually pretty crappy. Um, this is a toy that I only built with a couple of, maybe, 20 hours of work. <sighs> well, that's it. I'm just putting this up to show that it exists. Oh, here's a war. They do occasionally go to war. Uh, looks like Demnia and Head are in a pitched battle. I can actually turn it on, um, if I can remember the button. Ah, oh, there it is. Uh... Yeah, it looks like, um, actually it looks like uh, Head is fighting with a whole bunch of minor nations, but whatever. The point is that you can get a perfectly fine simulation of a world without any kind of resources at all. Now the question is whether or not this can support the kind of uh, cultural uniqueness that you want in a game of the sort I was describing earlier. And it turns out that uh, you need a little bit more. You do need something to give everyone their, their own... Um, 
personality, their own culture, but in essence, the thing that does the most for determining a city's culture and a city's um, economy and a city's well-being is its trade routes and how those trade routes are benefiting it. Um, if Joe Crossing decided to put a, a, uh, a blockade on their Denfield link, then chances are Joe Crossing and Denfield would both suffer. That's it.